In the articles and the resources online about Servant of God Teresa Higginson, it's surprising how few people seem to take her on her own terms. A lot of people want to view her through the lens of the strange and exciting phenomena purported to her, and then they remain focused on these. In fact, the supernatural whirlwind within which Teresa seemed to travel, aside from direct questions from her spiritual director, did not seem to interest her that much at all. Rather, for her, her point of focus, the all-absorbing interest of her life, was her personal vocation to promote a devotion to the sacred head of Jesus Christ as a seat of divine wisdom and as the completion of the devotion to the Sacred Heart. And that's what I want to focus on in my talk. It's easy to become fascinated by the external grazie gratis date which surround the life of this saintly Lancashire woman of the late 19th century. And that's understandable. She held the stigmata. It's reported that she was assaulted by the evil one on a frequent basis. She bilocated to remote corners of the world and, according to letters given to her spiritual director, seems like she reached the transforming union, the mystical marriage to Jesus Christ. But to take, just to take a cursory glance at St. Teresa and then put her in the category of St. Joseph of Cupertino or St. Christina the Astonishing and, and to leave her there, that will be quite a mistake. And I'm not mocking those great and holy saints for their miracles. Um, but in St. in Teresa Higginson, we find someone who has a theological insight, um, that is quite extraordinary among the the saints of the Catholic Church. Teresa, albeit a woman of incredible holiness, someone we can all admire, probably rather than imitate in her penances, she does remain a figure whose life's mission, whose vision, is of lasting relevance to our times. Those who interacted with Teresa, both her close confidants, but also the people with whom she merely had a passing acquaintance, they tell us that Teresa was deeply invested in the task of spreading a devotion to the sacred head. Here was her life's mission. Teresa did her best to hide the mystical phenomena which surrounded her, but was very prolific in her efforts to promote and diffuse the message, the revelation that she had received. Like St. Margaret Mary, who in many ways parallels the servant of God, we find here a calling from Almighty God towards a simple and deeply religious woman, a calling to work to establish a new public devotion, and indeed a new feast day within the universal calendar of the church, a devotion expressly ordered to the errors of that day and time. So when we think of St. Margaret Mary, the errors were of Jansenism and Calvinism, a denial or a negation of the love of Jesus Christ and a distortion of the nature of the atonement as something merely punitive and legal rather than sacrificial and reparative. For Teresa, the errors were less to do with the affect and a forced view of Christ's selfless and sacrificial love, and more to do with the intellect and the assault in these days that secular minds have made uh, through their false understanding of the universe um, and of a radical rejection of the natural and moral law sown into the reality of our being and of their denial of the place, the important place of Christ in the panorama of history. Okay, at a fundamental level, the intellectual landscape of the second half of the 19th century was not so much different from ours today. We already had a kind of um, rationalism in philosophy and in theology, a kind of modernism that demands a demythologizing of sacred scriptures. So that was her context, and it's largely our context as well. And in that context, Teresa received from God, in a way she did not fully comprehend, 
a devotion to the intellect of the incarnate Logos, that is, an emphasis on the wisdom of God as governing and ruling all creatures, all creation from the sacred head of Christ and wise in guiding all the volitional movements of his sacred heart. She was given this and she was informed, enlightened, that this devotion would provide an answer to the great crisis of her times and which I've said has continued unchecked into ours. As Teresa's earthly life drew to a close, she was quite aware that her vision, the devotional emphasis she had been given, was something that would mature and ripen and come into full force only in a latter era. And whilst Teresa was never taught when and how this would come to pass, she was certain that it would do great things in this country of England and that it would help to bring back many of the separated brethren, those who have fallen into the false religion of the Church of England, back into the one true fold of the Catholic Church. The truths of Teresa's devotion to the Sacred Head were also carefully and systematically brought into the realm of dogmatic theology by an English priest of uh, the last century, Father Edward Holloway. His writings are worth reading. They're to be commended for taking seriously the theological importance of Teresa's mystical insights, and he tries to represent the entire Catholic faith through the framework of Christ, the eternal wisdom incarnate, through whom all things were made, his sacred head crowned as king of the cosmos and lord of history. Okay, also, Teresa herself expected a proof for her devotion. She said this, a proof would come. And she knew at the same time that this would not be a miraculous proof. She didn't think it would be something sensational. Um, perhaps, perhaps in some of the theology of Father Holloway, uh, we're going to find, at least in embryonic form, this proof for the devotion to the sacred head as the seat of divine wisdom because what he offers in his theology is a springboard from which to utilize this devotion as an intellectual response to the scourges of rationalism and atheistic materialism those false ideologies which afflict the sacred head of christ and continue to poison the minds of the young and impressionable so whether you want to read father holloway or not the point is that saint teresa's writings although teresa's writings although they're deeply mystical uh, and only fragments of her letters have been published there are theological riches there and philosophical ones which are surely going to be of importance in responding to the intellectual errors of all of our time materialism atheism just as the devotion to the sacred heart was of crucial importance in combating the errors in saint margaret mary's time okay so here's just two quotations maybe pointing out the theological riches in uh, Teresa's writings. Here's the first one, uh, ponder this. She writes, he, God, showed me how man by mad folly tries also to rob nature of its God, trying to prove that matter is eternal and creative in itself and that there is no God or no need for God that so matter and nature are created of themselves and need no creative or providential power to call them into being or maintain them in existence. So Teresa is shown by God an insight into the nature of creation and its relationship with God. Um, she's being told that matter should not be conflated with mind and that matter itself cannot just exist, but that matter is that which is controlled and directed by mind, and that existence and development of the universe requires mind and reflects the existence of a mind. At least that's what I'm taking from her writings there. Um, something that is really needs to be asserted when you think about people in our day trying to 
argue that the universe just is, that it's just creation, and that's always been there. God, through Teresa, is asserting that the nature of matter demands a mind to order it, to control it, to direct it. Here's another theologically important quote. She writes, Christ, God made man, is the beginning and end of all creation, and his knowledge and wisdom are infinite as they are eternal. So she says that incarnate wisdom is not just our personal lawgiver and the pattern of human living, you know, as is echoed in her prayerful refrain, O wisdom of the sacred head, guide me in all my ways. But also she understands that the wisdom of God is guiding creation um, and is indeed the culmination of creation through the mystery of the incarnation. This is an idea which is in the prologue of St. John, uh, but for her, it's it's something that we haven't really grasped yet, that the whole of creation, the whole of creation is ordered towards the incarnation. So she firmly is in the Franciscan camp of theology, uh, seeing um, the incarnation of God in human history as something that was not conditioned by the fall. Okay, Uh, so a devotion to the sacred head of Christ, seat of divine wisdom, is uh, something that can give us something to respond to new atheism, materialism, and those who want to put Christ as just another character in the history of the world. But here's another thing. Here's another way the devotion has a content that is capable of of responding to another great crisis of this moment. And maybe this is one that will relate, you'll relate to even more. Um, it's a bit more, you know, transparent than that theological thing I was just saying. Um, the devotion to the sacred head combats the false conception of love that is now prevalent in public discourse. A love that is purely will and affect cut loose from reason and nature think about all this stuff you know um you know i'm in love with i'm in love with him Um, therefore um we have to be together um a devotion to the sacred head as the seat of wisdom guiding all the movements of the sacred heart reminds fallen man that all too often the heart is deceptive as scripture says in prophet jeremiah and that Christians are called to have the have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, as we really read in Philippians. We are called to to kind of commune our autonomy to the governments to the governments of the divine wisdom, to submit to the divine wisdom for His law to be, as it were, our environment, the means of our true flourishing. In order for fallen and confused humanity to have access to this divine wisdom, this law, we need to look to the Catholic Church, which St. Teresa insisted has been established by God as the infallible and continuous teacher of the wisdom of the sacred head throughout human history. Nowadays, love is understood as just something, you know, a feeling. But the devotion to the sacred head um, as governing all the movements of the sacred heart reminds us that in our own lives, love has to be governed by reason and that love ought to be governed by reason, um, just as we see modelled in the love of Christ. Um, It's a love that is that is burning in a sacred heart, but is governed in its expression by his sacred head, the seat of divine wisdom. So it ought to be with us. And the Catholic Church is the continued locus of the divine wisdom of Christ in the world. The Holy Catholic Church continues to teach, continues to teach with that authority of Jesus Christ, the sacred head, the seat of divine wisdom. So 
our response should be to call people, call the world to the Catholic faith so that the whole world can listen to its infallible teacher who can teach them about love, what it is to love, what the true nature of love is, that love is not just some emotional pull, but is necessarily governed by reason and reason redeemed by grace. God did not only become man in Jesus Christ in order to love the world and to redeem the world through his loving sacrifice. He also became man in order to teach the world, to guide the world through his sacred wisdom, a wisdom that is continually expressed in the teaching of the Catholic Church, which in a certain manner extends the infallibility of Jesus Christ through history. That's why devotion to the sacred head is of such importance within our church, because the church seems to have forgotten her own infallibility, her own God-endowed grace of teaching the world the truth. The church nowadays is listening to the world all the time, but God established the church in order to teach the world. And so St. Teresa, or Venerable Teresa, calls the church to become one with the sacred head of Jesus Christ, to realize that it's there to teach with his authority, to instruct the world with his authority so that the whole world can be brought away from the fires of hell and towards living the good life as God intended from the beginning. Let us now finish with a prayer. Let all creatures acknowledge, praise, bless and love this wisdom. Let them adore the sacred head of Jesus Christ as its seat. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.